My title is Feminist Struggles in the Middle East and North Africa. I think I should have been a bit more humble. <laughs> Because the, really the region is big with a lot of contextual diversity and any attempt of generalization is doomed to do injustice to the richness of the region. But having said this, I will still generalize a little bit. Um, when we say feminist struggles in Middle East and North Africa today, we're talking about two parallel processes that has been ongoing since the beginning of 2010s. On the one hand, popular protests and grassroots mobilizations in the region um, politicized thousands of young women. Um, and these women have joined various struggles for democratic rights. A lot of them organized and are still organizing in feminist organizations and or with feminist agendas. On the other hand, democratic demands of the protesters, even where it led to the fall of governments like in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, and Yemen, were quickly suppressed as the region experienced a high level of political instability because of authoritarian regimes, fundamentalist movements, deepening of ethnic and sectarian clashes, in some cases foreign intervention, and huge waves of migration and asylum seeking. So soon after the protests, Political polarization and increased violence of all forms created very difficult conditions for women to pursue feminist politics. Um, discussing feminist activism in, in the region, I mainly draw on the examples in Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Iran. I will omit Turkey and Kurdistan because Deniz and Feride will cover them later. And my discussion takes off from my belief for the need to, and I summarize it in five points, um, the need to A, complicate the simplistic categories of women as victims of violence, as well as women as agents of change. B, to move beyond superficial culturalist explanations that are popular in the West, like for example, attributing women's status to the constraints of Arab culture or Islam. And this is first of all because not everyone in the region is Arab or Muslim. C, to critically examine the tendency in the region as well as in some Western anti-imperialist discourses either to view women's rights as mere tools of cultural imperialism or to imagine a simple opposition between women's rights and Islam. D, to really look into the agenda of the feminist movements there to understand what's going on there for women and in terms of women's rights. And E, finally, to recognize the presence of certain common themes in the region and globally, but without skipping over contextual differences. Um, now, what's common in all contexts is this. Gender is part and parcel of social change, and the woman question is once again one of the main crystallizations of political antagonism in the region. Today, in the post-2010 era, this reveals itself most concretely in the issues of violence against women and of women's rights. So, in the remaining of my talk, I will first talk about violence against women and then about the status of women's rights in dominant and oppositional feminist discourses. So, since 2010, changes of political regime went hand in hand with changes in the forms of patriarchal control over women's lives, where body politics, as Nadia Al Ali points out, had a central position. During the protests, women were treated differently than men, meaning, in addition to being beaten up, women were subjected to organized sexual harassment, or, as in the case of Egypt, were subjected to virginity tests. In other words, both the state forces and counter-revolutionary groups have used harassment and rape as effective tools to suppress the democratic demands and to discredit and impair the dignity of the people who came up with those demands. But this was also a reaction to women's presence in the public sphere as political subjects. This is what Denis Candioti has called a masculinist restoration, meaning where, where regimes feel challenged by political movements, there is often a really violent attempt of restoring patriarchy alongside other authoritarian ways of governing. Um, 
This is, of course, different than the sexual violations that take place in conflict zones and in refugee camps, where rape is used as a tool of war and sexual exploitation in the total absence of any protective or supportive measures for the survivors. But in the previous case, where women are subjected to organized sexual violence in the public sphere, we see a mushrooming of feminist organizations that adopt new forms of organizing and document and challenge the assaults women face. Here, technology, that is social media, has been enormously helpful in collecting and documenting cases of sexual assault and therefore breaking the taboos about speaking up and gathering, politicizing a lot of people, especially young women, around the issue. It also helped these women to organize despite the state and asking for the state to be accountable anyway. What's also rather new, well, actually, I want to give one example from Egypt that is a collection, that is a collective called Girls' Revolution, Tavrat El Banat. This organization, founded in 2012, has 135,000 followers on Facebook and Twitter. This is, this is a really big number. And since 2012, they alone, and there are many organizations like this, they alone have collected stories over 11,000 women. Um, what's also rather new here is that women's organizing against sexual assault is more and more supported by men, especially by young men. These men, as Al Ali points out, started to recognize that their vision of a new society, that is an inclusive democratic society, has to have women's rights, gender-based justice, and a decrease in gender violence as central issues and not just push, push to the mar margins. To this, I shall add that during the protests, these men have shared the same space with women, collaborating in their resistance against state violence, sleeping together at nights, in short, transgressing traditional sexist norms. And this seems to have triggered a change in the gender values of these people. So now we see men standing side by side with women protesting against sexual harassment in many countries. And they're not only among the audience of feminist organizations, but they actually more and more volunteer for them. Of course, to what extent the participation of men is permanent or just conjunctural, we are yet to see. Accompanying the rise in violence against women is the discrediting of the women's rights agenda altogether. Whatever the form of political Islamism they adopt, ranging from Salafism, Jihadism to moderate Islamism, the dominant groups in the region today tend to systematically discriminate against women along with sexual and religious minorities. But they usually do this without necessarily denying their adherence to some form of women's rights. So it's possible to spot two tendencies when it comes to the dominant discourses. First one is to label the women's rights agenda as an elitist legacy of the previous regimes and to pursue, as a way of differentiating themselves from these regimes, a politics of keeping women within the confines of religions, cultural, or traditional norms. This was, for example, the strategy of Muslim brothers in Egypt before the coup, when they joined forces with the Salafists to lift the 10% woman quota in the parliament, women's representation fell from almost 13% to less than two. But a more widespread attitude seems to be passing a legal reform and then giving up on its implementation, both to avoid criticism from the West and to shut down the oppos opposition in local contexts. Again, if we look at Egypt, the interim government following the coup in 2013 changed the Egyptian constitution to ensure the appropriate representation of women and, the, and to guarantee their right to hold public offices. In practice, however, women are not only excluded from state making, but also disregarded as political actors in civil society, and there is no sanctioning. In Tunisia, too, the new constitution adopted in 2014 ensures gender equality, but feminists express the difficulties they face in its implementation. In Iraq, women had some gains, such as the quota for political representation, but the relatives of conservative politicians ended up in the parliament, and they are not necessarily promoting women's rights. To these two main discourses, we should, of course, add what happens when security becomes the main concern and when a discussion on women's rights has to start with women's involvement in peace processes. 
Iraq, for example, in 2014 became the first country in the Middle East to adopt a national action plan for the implementation of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325. But women in Iraq, given the armed conflict with the Islamic State especially, became the means to pay debts and settle clan disputes rather than being active elements in resolving disputes and negotiations. So what about the status of women's rights for feminist activists? Now, there are feminist groups in the region that totally refrain from a discourse of rights because of its liberal and or imperialist connotations. But the majority of them, one way or another, draw on a discourse of rights and rely on its legitimizing power. And here I find very relevant that Lama Abu Odeh warns us against the easy conclusion that local gender activists in the Middle East and North Africa, by using a discourse of rights, comply with Western imperialist projects and become instrumentalized by transnational bodies like the UN, the World Bank, and so on. And this warning is important because of the affinity between some anti-imperialist critiques in Western leftist discourses and the dominant nationalist or ethnic or religious actors in the region that are antagonistic to the politics of gender and sexuality. In other words, looking down upon the language of rights because it's a Western imperialist import, say many feminists in the region, works to the advantage of the conservatives the most. Of course, this is not to disregard the fact that liberal feminists in the West and their collaborators in the Global South have supported and are still supporting imperial missions regarding women and the politics of gender. But what I'm simply saying is that not every activist or feminist group that subscribes to a language of rights serves an imperial purpose. It's just a more complex issue and we need to go beyond reductionist accounts and look instead into what activists intend to do by using the rights framework. There are a lot of new organizations that use the language of rights simply in order to synchronize their language with those of foreign donors. But then once they get the money, they do what they do, tackling the issue ranging from, um, to give an example from Lebanon's female collective, refugees and prisoners, to migrants and domestic workers, to rural women's cooperatives, women in trade unions, and so on. Another use of the rights framework is in transnational processes which serve as a leverage for women who deal with legal reform. In the case of post-revolution Tunisia, international human rights law served as a crucial resource for feminists in drafting a new constitution. Likewise, in Egypt, feminists who participated in the drafting of the new constitution were able to form coalitions with other parties by appealing to transnational gender equality frameworks such as CEDAW. These frameworks also help women to build regional coalitions on the basis of post-2010 developments, such as the Coalition of Women's Human Rights Defenders in the Middle East and North Africa, or the Forum for Women in Politics in the Arab Region. Now, I'd like to mention two more functions of the rights framework that are worth noting. Mm -hmm. One is about political participation, which takes the form of participating in peacemaking in conflict zones. Syrian Women's Forum for Peace, for example, works to empower women in peacemaking by educating them about the UN Resolution 1325, which is a crucial task now, since so far women have been completely excluded from peace talks. Similarly, Libyan Women's Platform for, for Peace has worked to ensure that women remain a part of post qaddafi Libya, thanks to their efforts, among other things. In 2012, Libyan women won 16.5% of the positions in the first elected national congress in 52 years. The other function of the rights framework is about the politicization of issues related to sexuality. There is an increasing number of feminist organizations that tackle women's bodily and sexual rights, that challenge orientalist misconceptions of gender and sexuality in the region, that engage with LGBTQ issues and address homophobia as a problem for gender equality. And this is important because the discourse of women as mothers, daughters, and sisters in many contexts become safer, culturally acceptable identities that legitimize women occupying political space and thereby silencing the problems related to sexuality. Now, 
Um, having said all this, I really don't mean to draw a perfect picture of feminists in the MENA region. Of course, there are a number of quite problematic areas, and here I want to point at two that I think are the most pressing today. Um, first one relates to feminists distancing themselves from what is deemed religious in favor of what is considered modern as secular, and thereby reproducing the binary between women's rights and Islam. This is problematic in the 2010s, especially because in this period, a lot of women also mobilize under Islamist parties and movements. They know how to use religion and tradition in order to recruit new members in their movement. In the long run, secular feminists who decide not to engage with legal or political questions emanating from interpretations of Islam end up being unprepared to contest the agendas put forward by Islamists who come to power. So this adds to their marginalization. Another thing, and that's by now the elephant in the room, I guess, is that a focus on labor and class, as well as a critique of patriarchal capitalism, is very much missing in the women's rights agenda in the region. Here, I have to say that I have limited access to the sources since I don't speak Arabic, and I'm very sure that there, are that there are women out there who tackle the intersections of gender and class, but class and labor are definitely not the highlights in the feminist agenda. And the omission of labor is not limited to labor in the public sphere. When it comes to the private sphere, women's oppression is associated mostly with physical and sexual violence, but not with the appropriation of women's labor in the family institution. Of course, the absence of these categories should also be read against the background of the current status of the labor movement in the region, so it's not to be blamed only on women. But politicizing the issue of labor in relation to gender is crucial since one very important function of the attacks on women's rights is to render invisible the continuity between old and new regimes in terms of their neoliberal policies. So the omission of class questions adds to, in another way, adds to feminist marginalization. Before finishing up, I also want to draw attention to the fact that most of the processes I mentioned here are common concerns for feminists globally. So there is no need to isolate the MENA region and to create some sort of Arab exceptionalism or Muslim exceptionalism. Um, salience of all fundamentalisms, fundamentalisms of all sorts, smear campaigns against feminists, progressive legal frameworks that don't improve women's material conditions, and an increased state surveillance over women's lives are some of these concerns. So to conclude, the new regimes in the Middle East and North Africa lack democratic participatory pluralist principles and they have no intention to listen to the demands of women for social justice and for the redistribution of power. At the moment, women are witnessing a powerful, violent backlash and the destruction of even the possibility of democratic struggle to further their rights. But at the same time, women's insistence on participating in political processes and to fight for their rights also opens up new spaces for redefining the terms of gender relations that are, as it seems today, rather irreversible. So I, unlike what my abstract said, I didn't put out a very optimistic account of what's going on, but, well, I mean, it's, uh, we are yet to see the conclusion of this struggle, so we shouldn't be that pessimistic either, after all. <laughs>